بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم We begin with Allah's blessed name We praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified And we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers on our father Adam our father Abraham on Moses on Jesus and on his mother the blessed virgin Mary and on the last of them all the blessed prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam our topic brothers sisters and friends assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and a very good afternoon to you our topic is actually islam the international monetary system and the future of money if during my talk you get scared and worried please don't take out your is it called ipad or blackberry to check to see whether your money is still in your account in the bank <coughs> it might not be there that's one of the frightening things about the future of money from the time we speak of islam the implication is that i have to turn to the quran and i cannot turn to the quran without the help and guidance of he who was appointed as the teacher of the Quran namely the blessed prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam so you would be intrigued how is he going to go to the Quran and to the word of the prophet the hadith in order to deal with international monetary economics that's the question you must be having in your minds at the moment but fortunately i was the student <coughs> of a great teacher maulana dr muhammad fadlur rahman ansari rahimahullah whose greatest contribution to the world of scholarship by far his greatest contribution was to teach a methodology for the study of the Quran and then to turn to the hadith to supplement the Quran and that methodology will be used inshallah today we are before i forget we are honored in fact tonight today to have two of his daughters present and two of his granddaughters present and we welcome them with a special welcome to this gathering i was resident in new york for some 10 years and i got an invitation from the methodist church uh they wanted me to give an address to a gathering a convention of methodist ministers so i drove my ford escort all the way to poconos i think it's called the mountains and eventually found the place the convention center and there were more than 200 ministers present i i know that there were some arabs there may have been some from africa but most of them were european ministers and i delivered my address introducing islam to them and when the question and answer session came an elderly minister got up holding the quran in his hands and i said to myself oh my gosh this is trouble and he said to me shake you've given a very nice address and you've been very friendly to us and we appreciate that but your book says don't take christians as friends <laughs> don't take christians as friends can you explain 
he was referring to Surah Al-Ma'idah of the Quran and I chose to begin the lecture today in this way because this verse of the Quran is connected with the monetary system <laughs> the verse of the Quran says and you might want to do your homework when you get back home pick up your copy of the Quran it's chapter 5 and the verse should be about 51 and the translation of the Arabic text O oh, you who have faith in the one God do not take Jews and do not take Christians as your friends and allies and because we use the wrong methodology I'll continue the verse in a moment because of the wrong methodology nearly every single copy of the Quran that you take up with an explanation of the verse assumes that the verse is speaking of all Christians and all Jews but when we use the proper methodology by going to the whole of the Quran we find no it's not possible because elsewhere in the Quran Allah speaks about Christians and he says that in time to come you will find that they would be the closest of all to you in love and affection that would be somewhere around verse 83 of chapter 5 so it could not be speaking of all Jews and all Christians so now using the proper methodology we ask well if the verse is not speaking of all Jews and all Christians well then which Jews and which Christians and the answer is right there in the words which follow listen carefully do not take such Jews and such Christians as your friends and allies who themselves are friends and allies of each other oh but Christians and Jews were never friends and allies the Christians accuse the Jews of the ultimate crime of killing God himself and there was so much hatred between them and so the Quran is anticipating a time which is to come when a mysterious reconciliation will take place and a Judeo-Christian friendship and Judeo-Christian alliance is going to emerge and then having prohibited us from being friends and allies of the Judeo-Christian alliance the verse goes on to say whosoever from amongst you turn to them with friendship and alliance I hope we don't have any Saudis here today do we <laughs> whosoever from amongst you turn to them with friendship and alliance you no longer belong to us you now belong to them meaning when you die and in the grave the angel comes to question you you will learn that you not recognize as a Muslim you now recognize as a member of the Judeo-Christian Alliance in Allah la yahdil qawm al-zalimin and then the verse ends with these words that surely Allah provides no guidance to a people who are wicked indicating that the trademark of that Judeo-Christian Alliance will be wickedness and oppression the monetary system that we now have in the world the international monetary system that we now have in the world was crafted crafted by that Judeo-Christian Alliance which today is recognized as a Zionist Judeo-Christian Alliance not all Christians belong to that alliance and not all Jews belong to that alliance and so a Jew who does not belong to that alliance a Christian who does not belong to that alliance and turn to us with friendship and with respect we have the right to return to respond with friendship and alliance to Jews, to Christians, to Hindus, to Buddhists 
to anyone else in the rest of the world who shows respect and who want to be friends but not that Judeo-Christian alliance it is that Judeo-Christian alliance which empowered modern western civilization which then used that mysterious power to colonize the rest of the non-European world and when they colonized notice carefully that they never decolonized without putting in place certain institutions all of mankind all through history used gold and silver as money yes there were crooks usually governments <laughs> which will start to put in an alloy into the gold and into the silver so that you could make more money so you begin with a hundred percent silver or ninety nine percent silver and then some king comes along and he wants to expand his money so he makes it ninety percent <laughs> and then he makes it eighty percent until eventually you end up with zero point two percent of silver and the rest is all bogus so yes there were crooks even when we had gold and silver as money but there were others who maintained the integrity of money like for example the Ottoman Islamic Empire who had police officers in the market and the police officers in the market were there to ensure the weight and the purity of coins and if you were caught in the market with a coin which is bogus you will be tried in the market and if found guilty you will be published right you will be punished right there in the market perhaps this is why scholars at the state university uh, of New York in Binghamton who researched the market came to the conclusion that the last free and fair market that the world experienced was the market of the Ottoman Islamic Empire but when Europe colonized what they did was to remove gold and silver coins from the market which had been used for thousands of years and they replaced it with new money that they had created and today's lecture is meant to describe to you that new money that was European at the end of the second world war the conquerors, the winners, the victors of the war invited the rest of the world to come and join with them in a conference in Bretton Woods in upstate New York to create a new international monetary system and uh, it will be interesting for those of you who want to further research the subject to go and find the uh, documents relating to that conference and read them Britain and the United States dominated the conference France was there and France had good thinking yes I have to credit France with good thinking but France was overpowered in that conference and so it became an Anglo-American conference really the Americans were led by a man named Mr. White and of course the British were led by John Maynard Keynes and they decided that the new monetary system which will be based on European paper money paper currency or some, sometimes called fiat money must have some link with gold and therefore link with integrity 
Once there's a link with gold, there is some measure of integrity. And because Britain's sun was setting and a new sun had risen to replace the British sun, the sterling pound, which previously was the international currency in the world, and London, which was the capital, the financial capital of the world, was now replaced and the US dollar was chosen. And hence Washington now became the international financial capital. The link with the, do with the goal was that the US dollar would be redeemable. To redeem means you can take the paper and have it converted to gold. Redeemable. The US dollar was redeemable in gold. And they fixed the rate at $35 US for one ounce of gold. But you and I could not redeem our dollars. Only governments, only central banks could do that. And so the United States government under international law was obliged to redeem dollars for gold at $35 an ounce. One of the major pillars of an international order is called Pacta Sunt Servanda, the treaty obligations must be honored. And that's the first verse, the very first verse of Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter 5 of the Quran. When you give your word, you must keep your word. And so the United States had an obligation under international law to keep their word, to redeem US dollars for gold at $35 an ounce whenever a central bank or a government wanted it redeemed. And that was meant to demonstrate to the world that this monetary system had some integrity because there was a link with gold. Or what about all the rest of the other paper money in the world? What about the French franc? What about the German mark? The Pakistani rupee? The Malaysian ringgit? The Singapore dollar? Brunei dollar? The agreement was that all the other currencies in the world, paper currencies, would have their value determined on the basis of their link with the dollar. And so if you ask, well, what's the value of the Malaysian ringgit? You do not answer and say, that the Malaysian ringgit is so many ringgits to one ounce of gold. No, sir. Only Uncle Sam has that honor. <laughs> the Malaysian ringgit is worth 3.04 ringgits to one dollar. That's the answer. You do not give the value of the ringgit converted to francs. No. Because this monetary system was meant to entrench the United States of America as a new ruling state in the world to replace Britain. So it was not mere economics. It was not mere monetary economics. It was also politics. It was also world politics. It was a monetary system which was being crafted which would entrench the United States as the ruling state in the world. From that conference, which was called the Bretton Woods Conference, emerged the Bretton Woods Accord. And if you are a student of finance, of monetary economics, you must study that Bretton Woods Accord. From that Bretton Woods Accord emerged the International Monetary Fund as the world's central bank. 
and the International Monetary Fund had rules which required every member state to deposit with the fund listen carefully 25% of all your gold reserves in the process of delivering to the International Monetary Fund 25% of all the gold that Pakistan had number one the impression was created that this monetary system is based on gold the gold is there the actual fact was they wanted to know how much gold you had number one and number two they had a strategy the articles of agreement of the International Monetary Fund listen carefully prohibited the use of gold as money why is there anyone underneath the clouds and underneath the Sun who could answer that question when Dr. Mahathir in this country some maybe 10 years ago decided that it would be good to introduce gold in ours as money at least for government to government transactions he was not aware someone had to inform him that international law prohibits the use of gold as money why the answer was if you allowed gold and silver to remain in the market then this monetary system based on paper would collapse because the paper has a habit of leaking meaning falling in value <laughs> that's why it was crafted and as the paper fell in value you were ripped off and so they had to prohibit the use of gold as money where were the scholars of Christianity at that time where were the scholars of Judaism at that time where were the scholars of Hinduism and Buddhism and finally where were the scholars of Islam perhaps you know eating roti chanai drinking tetari because here as plain as daylight was something which should have troubled them the Quran the Quran recognizes gold dinar as money the word dinar is in the Quran the Quran uses the word dirham for silver as money and Prophet Muhammad Allah's blessings be upon him clearly clearly defined money as dinar and dirham gold and silver if Allah has made something halal and Dr. Zuhaidi Zainuddin will be happy to hear this now if Allah if Allah has has made something halal and you make it haram or prohibited then that's not just a normal sin no there's one sin only one sin that Allah will never forgive and that is blasphemy the Arabic word is shirk and in Surah Tawbah of the Quran it clearly mentions that this is shirk to make haram what Allah made halal or to make halal what Allah made haram and so in the process of prohibiting the use of gold as money the international monetary system was based on shirk but the scholars of Islam 
didn't notice it in 1944 because you know the Roti Chennai what is more amazing is that some 70 years have passed since the International Monetary Fund was established in 1944-45 and the world of Islamic scholarship has failed and failed miserably it is an embarrassment to recognize that this is shirk Not only is it shirk, but who created this new money? Who are the craftsmen who created this new money in order to give to the United States of America a privileged position in the world? Answer, the Judeo-Christian Zionist Alliance. The Zionist movement was created in 1890 eight i can be mistaken by a, a, a year or two you're not going to quarrel with me over that 1897-1898 and the quran prohibits you for being friends and allies of them and yet the whole world of islam today the whole world of islam the whole christian world the whole jewish world in fact the whole world have been absorbed in this new monetary system with very 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 few people being even aware that not only it is prohibited it is haram not only it is shirk but it is also meant to rip you off uh, you kindly excuse me for returning to the Quran one more time uh, in order to introduce you now to a branch of knowledge called eschatology eschatology is a study of the end time and it is a branch of knowledge which could not be mastered until the modern age so we have no <laughs> we have no books we have no classes in Islamic eschatology no, it could not be studied until this age. And this is the age when things are happening. When Pharaoh, you know Pharaoh from Egypt, was drowning. The Quran tells us something about what happened underneath the water. That he declared his faith in the one God of the Israelite people. Prior to this, he was declaring, I am the Lord Most High. <laughs> but when he was dying, he recognized that he wasn't God. I think the Japanese emperor also recognized he wasn't God after the end of the Second World War, perhaps. So <laughs> he declared his faith in the God of Banu Israel, the Israelite people. The Quran responded in the 10th chapter now, the 10th chapter, Surah to Yunus, and will be down towards the end of the chapter, where Allah says, Now, Pharaoh, now you're going to declare your faith. And prior to this, you were in a state of obstinate rejection, rebellion, and you were committing facade, meaning oppressing the people. Today we have decided, the God is the one God is speaking. Today we've decided to preserve your physical body. That your physical body, when it is discovered, when it resurfaces in the historical process, would be a sign. A sign for a people who would come after you. But most people are negligent of our signs. This is the verse. The body of Pharaoh was discovered in 1897 or 8. 
and the Zionist movement was created in the same year. The same year. And so when the Quran says that when the body of Pharaoh is discovered, this is a sign for a people to come after you. The answer is the Quran is referring to the Judeo-Christian Zionist Alliance. What is that sign? The sign is that the epic encounter between truth and falsehood, between arrogant power and the world of the sacred, between Pharaoh and Moses, which took place at that time and which ended with a divine intervention in the historical process. When Allah said to Moses, alayhi salam, take your rod and strike the water. My gosh, you'd love to see that video, eh? And the water parted. Why is farakna bikumul bah? And we parted the water. And jainakum and you were, you were able to cross with safety. And when Pharaoh and his army attempted to cross, guess what happened? The waters came down and they were drowned. They died. Indicating from an eschatological viewpoint that history is going to end with a re-occurrence, I wish I could find a better word, of that epic encounter between truth and falsehood. How will history end? When they put him on the cross and then they boasted, we've killed him because there he is on the cross, he's dead. He claimed that he was the Messiah, the son of Mary. But he's dead. So he couldn't be the Messiah. <laughs> Why? The Messiah has to rule the world from Jerusalem. And truth and justice has to triumph over all rivals and all injustice and oppression. And so they boasted. What they did not know, was it no, says Allah in the Quran, they did not succeed in killing him they did not succeed in crucifying him Allah made it appear like that Allah took his soul took his soul took his soul I repeated it three times and if Allah takes his soul but he did not he was not killed he was not crucified the implication is like what happened to you last night? Last night, Allah took your soul and returned it. That's what the Quran speaks of. So Allah took the soul when he was on the cross. And so they thought he was dead. And Allah returned the soul when no one was there. And then raised him. So he didn't die. But you would know this unless you come to the Quran but that's not the end of the story oh no Surah An-Nisa in the next verse says min ahlil kitab none of them will escape who rejected the true Messiah but rather when he returns before he dies they will all have to believe in him Every single one of them. So I was in a synagogue in, in New, New Jersey. And there were a few hundred Jews in the gathering. And I was speaking to them. And when I made mention of this, that when Jesus comes back, because he didn't die, all of you are going to have to believe in him as the true Messiah. When the lecture was over, they all surrounded me. And I am in the center 
and they were demanding from me not hostile politely but earnestly why should we have to believe in that which we have rejected why tell us why imagine me with a few hundred Jews all around me demanding an answer the answer is at that moment when the divine intervention takes place the veils are going to be removed and you'll be able to see the truth and so history is going to end in this way there has to be someone ruling the world from Jerusalem but the prophet said that before that there's going to be a false messiah and the false messiah was ruled from Jerusalem and that is why they wanted the United States of America in this monetary system to become the ruling state we can see now the dubious character of this monetary system which is intended to deliver to the United States and later on when we speak about petrodollars you're going to see how the system is working you will see now how the system is meant to deliver to the United States through this monetary system power over the rest of the world and then to deliver that power to a third ruling state which is about to emerge Israel so when Israel rules the world you'll have a new monetary system people will be gone it'll be all electronic money and then the banking system takes over from governments but we can see the evidence of the dubious character of this monetary system when in 1933 the US government at the behest of the Federal Reserve enacted legislation prohibiting the use of gold as legal tender why would you do that because there's some crisis in the system if there's a crisis in the system you must turn to gold because gold will restore stability ask any Argentinian and he'll tell you that the United States government prohibited the use of gold as legal tender number one 1933 number two if you were caught with gold after a certain date you would be fined 10,000 US dollars or you could spend six months in jail why this drastic measure you had to take your gold and give it to the government and the government will give you paper in its place at twenty dollars an ounce so all of the United States had to hand over their gold to Uncle Sam those who were smart shipped their gold to Switzerland and got away after the United States government had taken all the gold then in 1934 January I believe they then devalued the dollar what's that we never had this word before devalue we thought value was stable value is created by the one God how can you devalue money yes you can when you stop using money with intrinsic value gold and silver and you replace it with money which has no intrinsic value then you can devalue so we see the system working now the United States government devalued the US dollar from twenty dollars to one ounce of gold to 35 and then they removed the law prohibiting the use of gold as legal tender so all of America rushed to buy back their gold but in the process if you had if you had changed 100 gold coins 
of one ounce each and you got 2,000 US dollars and now you take the 2,000 US dollars to buy back your gold guess how many gold coins you got I think it will be around 57 or 58 where has your money gone who took it in this case it's so easy to understand that the money is in the pocket of Uncle Sam 43% of the wealth of the people has been unjustly acquired by the government which means the Federal Reserve to the simple expedient of devaluing the money that's what has been happening around the world since then and this was not the first I think it's called Ponzi scheme this monetary system this monetary system this Ponzi scheme had been tried through history by many 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 people the Chinese tried it <laughs> everybody who tried this Ponzi scheme eventually ended up losing it always collapsed always collapsed this particular Ponzi scheme began to shake when France decided under Charles de Gaulle that this was unjust the United States is printing more paper than they have gold if Dr. Zohaidi were to issue more checks then he has money in his account that would be fraudulent fraudulent and you could go to jail for that and that's what the US government was doing no other government could do that only the United States they were financing the Vietnam War by just printing and printing and printing more paper money and Charles de Gaulle was quite angry because the French could understand the unjust nature of the monetary system Charles de Gaulle got up in the French National Assembly and delivered a historic address in which he analyzed the monetary system and demonstrated how this monetary system was not only fraudulent but also was designed to give to the United States of America an unfair advantage over the rest of the world he then began to do something which shook the system France started to redeem dollars for gold <laughs> and the United States didn't like that at all because if the French could do it then Saudi Arabia might join the line and Kuwait might join the line and many other countries and because the United States did not have the gold for all the paper the whole thing would collapse the gold died he first had to resign and then he died but those who succeeded de Gaulle in France and I admire them so much continued the system continued the policy and how one wishes that Malaysia had those who could continue what Dr. Mahathir had started with Dinar so in August of 1971 the French came along again one more time Richard Nixon was uh, the US president and said hi Uncle Sam are you there three billion USD and we want the gold Nixon retired to Camp David that weekend that's what they usually do and he realized the game was up the game was up the Ponzi scheme had collapsed the United States can no longer continue 
delivering, re redeeming paper for gold. And so he delivered an, an address to the world and said, we gave our word, but we don't have to keep our word. Not in Islam. Not with those who follow Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. The characteristic of a true Muslim, the characteristic of a true Christian, of a true Jew, of a true Hindu, of a true Buddhist, is that when he gives his word, he keeps his word. That's the basis of international relations. Pacta sunt servanda. But that's what Richard Nixon did. He tore up. He tore up the Bretton Woods Accord. He decided to abandon the provisions of the International Monetary Fund. And so from September 1971, the US dollar is in no man's land. What's going to happen? Is this system, this money system going to collapse now? I have some interesting news to give to you now. From 1971 to 1973, the planning took place for the Arab-Israeli war. And the Zionists were on both sides of the fence. <laughs> so that the war could end with a draw, an honorable draw. And King Faisal of Saudi Arabia, Rahimahullah, had been making threats for some years after 1967 when they lost Jerusalem. he had been making threats to in, impose an oil boycott. Henry Kissinger was delighted to hear about the oil boycott. And so Henry Kissinger decided, I want it because I need something to replace the IMF gold standard. And so with unusual brilliance, shall I call it diabolical brilliance, they planned it. And they encouraged Faisal to impose the oil boycott. And as soon as the war started, Saudi Arabia imposed, this is October 1973, Saudi Arabia imposed an oil boycott on the United States. And they were miles long, the cars lining up miles long to buy gasoline. But Kissinger was smiling. <laughs> Kissinger was smiling because his plan was working. So once the war ended with an honorable draw, Kissinger saw and Wall Street assisted and the US dollar started to tumble. It lost its value by 400% in one year. At the beginning of the war, the US dollar was trading as $40 for an ounce of gold. And after the war, the United States dollar is now trading at $160 for an ounce of gold. This calamitous decline in the value of the US dollar had an impact on the price of oil. The Saudis were selling their oil for $3 a barrel. But with the collapse of the US dollar by 400%, the Saudis are now selling their oil at $12 a barrel. And the Saudis are smiling. So then Kissinger made his move. <laughs> brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. But before I tell you about his move, let me take you to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. And Il Mu'akhir was the man of Islamic eschatology. The Prophet said that among the signs of the last day is that the river Euphrates, which is in Iraq, will uncover 
the river Euphrates will uncover a mountain of gold. And people will fight over that gold. And 99 out of every 100 would be killed. And everyone will be saying, I am the one who will be saved. Indicating that this is not conventional warfare for that gold. This is nuclear warfare. Conventional warfare, no kill. Uh, 99 out of every 100. No. But the believers who worship the one God, who are there, should not touch that gold. That prophecy was fulfilled. This is religious symbolism. And religious symbolism has to be interpreted. Like, for example, the Prophet said that the Antichrist or Dajjal will travel on a donkey. And the donkey will travel as fast as the clouds. And the donkey will have his ears stretched out wide. There are our Salafi brothers who join with NATO to bring down the Libyan government and who are now fishing in Libya and now re receiving the punishment for their fishing in Libya and in Syria. And they say that once Allah and his Prophet have not interpreted, we have to wait for the flying donkey. Our methodology is different. We recognize this to be religious symbolism and we say this is the aircraft. The flying donkey is the aircraft, meaning the Antichrist will control the sky. Similarly with the mountain of gold. They say this has to be understood literally. And so we have to wait for the mountain of gold to come from underneath the river. We say no. When Kissinger went to Faisal in 1974, the stage had already been set. Faisal was, was already smiling because the collapse of the US dollar had trans transferred itself into rise in the price of oil for the Arabs. Kissinger said, this is peanuts. <laughs> this, from $3 to 12 this is peanuts. Meaning, the US dollar can go down and down and down and down and down and down and down. And as it goes down, the price of oil is going to go up and up and up and up and up. And you're going to become fabulously wealthy beyond your wildest dreams. And Kissinger was speaking the truth. He was correct. Indeed, our prophet said that the time will come for some of his followers who when they want to give zakat, zakat, charity, mandated charity, they will not be able to find anyone who would accept <laughs> the zakat in Qatar, for example unless it's a Bangladeshi driver or a Filipino maid or an Indonesian slave they're all slaves they're all slaves they work for the wage of a slave so they're slaves our daughters our daughters from Indonesia so you don't find anyone to accept and here was the fulfillment of the prophecy about to take place Kissinger said I ask only one thing of you that's all. And you become fabulously wealthy. And he was truthful. All that you have to do is to make a declaration that no one can buy oil from you other than with US dollars. Faisal said deal. <laughs> that was a haram agreement. Haram. Haram because the Prophet gave us a free market. And the free market means you, are, you cannot be restricted. Haram because the US dollar was now without anything to back it. It was in no man's land. But Faisal said deal. 
And when Faisal said deal, then the IMF monetary system went into history and a new monetary system emerged called the petrodollar monetary system. And so an ocean of oil, an ocean of oil began to function as a mountain of gold. This is my opinion. And to be fair to you, when I give an opinion, you should never accept it. Unless until you are convinced that it is correct. This is how I show respect for the intellect of my audience. Study the subject. Here is what the Prophet said. And here is my interpretation. And so now a new monetary system emerged called the petrodollar monetary system. And the US dollar is the mountain of gold. Previously they could print paper to finance the Vietnam War and so on. But now there is no limit. You can print as much paper as you want. There is no limit. The sky is the limit. And I am indebted to Dr. Mahathir for understanding this part of the subject. They no longer print paper. <laughs> it's too cumbersome. You need so much paper, you need so much ink. You need the security vans, you need the personnel to move it from place to place and so on. It's too cumbersome. They've created something called QE. Quantitative easing, QE. And so all that they need to do, France cannot do it, Germany cannot do it, Italy cannot do it, Britain cannot do it, only the United States, only the United States. You, you instruct the Federal Reserve Bank. Obama instructs the Federal Reserve Bank. I, I may be wrong, but I believe QE started with Obama. I may be wrong. I don't think it started with George Bush. I may be wrong. And the Federal Reserve will write a check. That's all. For seven trillion dollars. I thought that seven trillion was seven million billion. Somebody sent me an email. Shake, your maths is wrong. Seven trillion is not seven million billion. It's seven billion billion. <laughs> That's what he said to me. And the Federal Reserve will write that check and then send it to the banking system. And the banking system is now conglomerating around few banks. And they control all the rest. When that check reaches the banking system, it's not yet money. No. It's just a check. But when Egypt now signs an agreement with the IMF for a loan of four billion dollars, that's peanuts. When Egypt, Egypt signs the legal document to repay, now it is money. Not before. <laughs> and so, they are moving rapidly with quantitative easing to empower the banking system with a financial and monetary power unprecedented in history. This is preparatory to the collapse of the US dollar. Because I said that the Messiah has to rule from Jerusalem, the false Messiah first, our eschatology tells us through a hadith of the Prophet that there has to be a last ruling state to replace the United States. I wrote this book Jerusalem in the Quran some 12 years ago, published here in Malaysia. And in this book I said that the US dollar is going to collapse. And the United States will no longer be the ruling state in the world, 12 years ago. 
and that Israel is going to replace the United States as the next ruling state in the world. This was written 12 years ago. It has remained a bestseller for the last 12 years. Israel has to replace the United States. When Britain was the ruling state, there was one monetary system. When the United States replaced Britain, there was another monetary system. And so when Israel replaces the United States, you must have a new monetary system. I gave you a hint this now. The US dollar is going to collapse. It has already collapsed, actually. It's about 1800 US dollars now for one ounce of gold. Yeah, about 1800. If Israel attacks Iran, that's it for the US dollar. That's it. When the US dollar collapses, I believe what they will do is to demonetize it. Meaning it cannot be used as legal tender. So you have to take your dollars to redeem it for the new money that the United States government will issue. Many countries have done that in the past. The new money, however, when you redeem your US dollars, you'll only get a fraction of the value. Black America will lose a lot of money, but that's peanuts to what white America is going to use. And the United States have guns. People are allowed to buy guns. So the world can expect fireworks in the United States in the years to come. This is not any original analysis on my part at all. Many people have come to that conclusion. The US dollar is going to collapse. They're going to demonetize it. Some new money is going to come to replace it. And there's going to be fireworks in the United States when people are ripped off of their wealth. The collapse of the US dollar will reverberate in the monetary system around the world. And people who are holding weak, weak currencies, like the Pakistani rupee, the Bangladeshi taka, the Indonesian rupiah, the Egyptian pound, etc., they're going to be in a state of panic when the US dollar collapses. And they're going to want to dump their paper money as fast as they can because of runaway inflation. And as they dump their paper, the inflation is going to multiply. And so the system will collapse like butter easily. And make way for the new monetary system of only invisible and intangible electronic money. And that's why I ask you, please put away your blackberries and so on. Because once, once money is only electronic money, your money is not safe in any bank. Can you take your money out of the bank? Huh? No, you cannot. <laughs> you can't take your money out of the bank. Because there's nothing to take out. It's only electronic impulses. All that you can do is transfer money from one account to another. And sometimes, instead of you transferring your money from your account to another account, somebody who is a, uh, a wizard <laughs> with computers can hack into your computer and get your password. Huh? get your password and then go into your bank and have your bank account and he have a feast of chicken and <laughs> duck and <laughs> he clean it out that's coming i think you probably already have examples of that but the banking system is keeping it secret they don't want it to be done so the new monetary system of only electronic money is very vulnerable and thieves can steal your money without you having any knowledge of it and when your money is stolen after a certain time the banks are going to say enough is enough we're not going to replace it i don't think they're going to come after you if you only have ten thousand ringgits in your account but if 
you are a specialist doctor. <laughs> you better be careful. You better be careful. Our next speaker is probably going to be able to help you when you are faced with this predicament. What should I do if I have all my money in a bank account? First of all, take it out. Don't leave it there. It's safer actually in your own hands than in the bank. If you think it's safe over there, wait and see what's coming. But before I end, there's something more to be said about the future of money. I was attending a, an interfaith dialogue, Judaism, Christianity and Islam at uh, Drew University in the United States. I was a solitary speaker for Islam and I was outnumbered. There were so many rabbis and so many Christian ministers. Wow. But it was a very interesting experience to dialogue with Jews and Christians at that time. So during the process of the, the, the dialogue, I said that when Jesus went into the temple, the, the, the gospel says that he found the money changers ripping off the people and he cursed them and he overturned their tables and he chased them out of the temple but they don't tell us this about Christmas, about Christmas time when they only talk about the lamb hmm? this, <laughs> this was Jesus the lion so I said I don't think they were money changers I think they were lending money on interest oh my gosh when I said that, the rabbis were smiling, the ministers were smiling. We got him around now. <laughs> so one of the chief rabbis got up, smiling and very gently said to me, No, Imran, you're wrong. Let me tell you what is right. <laughs> and then he explained to me, in a very nice way he did it. You see, Imran, the temple minted its own coins. Because the Roman government, when they minted their coins, they'll put the head of that, the British call him a bloke, the emperor, <laughs> on the coin. And this was haram. It's not kosher. Because graven images are prohibited by the Lord. But the people had to come to the temple. For example, you wanted to sacrifice a goat. You're not allowed to sacrifice it yourself. Someone in the temple has to sacrifice it in order for it to be halal. And then you've got to pay the temple. And there are many other things you had to pay the temple. But you could not pay the temple with Roman money. Because that money was haram. Because of the graven image. So the temple minted its own coins. And when the people came to the temple, they had to go to the money changers and the money changers will change the Roman money for the temple money. And in the process of changing that money, they were ripping them off. That is the correct answer, Imran. So I bowed my head in humility. Thank you for correcting me. Not knowing, not knowing that 20 years later, that correction that they gave to me would come to help me with my Islamic eschatology. The false messiah, Dajjal, cannot rule the world from Jerusalem and have Jews accept him as the true messiah if Israel is using bogus money. No. Israel will have to mint gold and silver coins and these gold and silver coins will have no graven images and so now I realize that history is going to end with a return to gold and silver coins as money because Israel would have replaced the United States and the rest of the world following Israel will have to return to gold and silver coins as money this is coming I don't know how soon, maybe 20 years or so, but this is coming. And it is amazing, as I speak, that there are so many 
states in the United States of America which are now either enacting legislation or about to do it to make gold and silver legal tender. Utah was the first. Our next speaker probably has more knowledge of this subject than I do. And so now we end our talk on Islam, the international monetary system and the future of money. And from now we can look forward to a collapse of paper money and uh, the universal embrace of electronic money with all the hazards they can simply freeze your account because they find an email in your computer terrorists that's all and they freeze your account you can't do anything about it you can't take your money out of the account no there's nothing to take out so what to do we know that gold and silver is coming but in Islam, we say that gold and silver is money, it is sunnah money. And so what we do now is to try to change our bogus and fraudulent and utterly haram paper money and get gold and silver and replace it. And then try as often as we can to buy and sell using gold and silver. Let me end with a talk I gave at the Palma Hotel for the Juma Friday about two weeks ago I said to the management of the Palma Hotel in Ampang Point which boasts that it is the only Sharia compliant hotel in Malaysia I said listen the Palma if somebody comes to stay in your hotel and offers to pay the bill in dirhams and you say you're not accepting it number one you're committing a sin and number two, you're no longer Sharia compliant. <laughs> Our plan is to move out of the city, to build villages. And in our villages, we'll have micro markets. And in our markets, we will not allow bogus money to be used. No. We will use dinar and dirham. And based upon the teachings of Prophet Muhammad if there is a shortage of dinar and dirham in Medina, what did they use as money? Come on, tell me. Dates. MashaAllah, you know the answer. Korma. In Medina, they would use dates as money if there was a shortage of dinar and dirham. They would use wheat as money. They would use barley as money. They would use salt as money. So I'm fond of saying if you're in Java and you want to bring back gold and silver and you don't have enough, what would you use as money? The answer is not nasi, baras, baras, yeah. <laughs> you would use rice as money. And if you're in Cuba and you know that Fidel Castro no longer smokes cigars, no. If you're in Cuba, the island of Cuba which is in the Caribbean from where I come and you want to bring back sunnah money dinar and dirham and you have a shortage front, front row don't answer what would you use as money? front row don't answer huh? don't tell me tobacco <laughs> answer sugar, gola Can the government come and ban you from using rice? Oh, what a joke. The government cannot even prevent us from minting gold and silver today. The next speaker is minting gold and silver. So tomorrow the government will not be able to prevent you from buying and selling with gold and silver. I pray and I ask you to kindly join with me to pray that one day we'll be able to recover money with integrity in it. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka inta samir alim. وتب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين. You might find this little booklet interesting, the gold dinar and silver dirham, Islam and the future of the money. Uh, we also have it as a lecture DVD. They're all outside. Thank you. ولا أقوى على نار الجحيم
Allah faham tau batau fir dunubi fa'inna ka ghafiru dhambi Si ala wala aku ala naril jahim Allah faham beli tau batawal fir dunubi fa'inna ka ghafiru zambi